Praise God from whom all blessings flow. My name is Pastor Tyrone P. Jones IV, and I exclusively want to welcome you to worship on today. In fact, this service was designed with you in mind. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our worship experience today. First Baptist Church of Guilford is a loving church, a warm church, an inviting church, and so we thank and praise God for you stopping by on today. If you want to know more about First Baptist Church of Guilford, you can go to www.fbcog.org. Amen. God bless you. Come on in. Let's praise the Lord together. God some praise. Amen. God is good. Thank you, Ensemble, for blessing us. We do not want the Lord to pass us by. Amen. On this Pentecost Sunday, we're going to begin a new sermon series that we'll be preaching all month long called The Fire of God. And we're going to start this in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. While you're turning to Exodus, the second book of the Bible, amen. While you're turning to Exodus, I failed to mention that for the bill pay, it's going to be up to the one, first 100 families that we're going to bless. And we are in search of volunteers to help us on the 24th with the distribution of food. So if you'd like to help us on June 24th from 11 to 2, call the church office and sign up. And finally, we want to thank God for a wonderful, wonderful prayer walk on yesterday. Uh, God truly blessed us. We were able to go all throughout the neighborhood and pray. Amen. Thank Reverend Ford and an intercessory prayer ministry. Exodus chapter 3. I want to begin reading at verse 1 and end at verse 6. <clears throat> It begins the reading of God's word, and I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, priest of Midian, as he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Now Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I ask you to assume a posture of prayers for the next few moments that are mine to share. As we begin this sermon series, The Fire of God, I want to preach about fresh fire. Fresh fire. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come now this moment of preaching. We thank you, Lord God. The pen has met the paper. The pastor has now mounted the pulpit. People have assembled, Lord God, in the pews and in their homes. And now we await the power that comes from you from on high. Bless us and keep us, Lord. We thank you in advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fresh fire. Love it, today is Pentecost. Pentecost is a significant time in the life of of the church universal. It's significant because Pentecost details 
what Jesus foretold prior to his ascension on the 40th day after the resurrection in which he says, I must go. But I love it in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where Jesus says, as I leave, uh, you're going to receive power, power from on high to be my witnesses in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the world. And it is there that Jesus ascended into heaven. After that, the Bible shares with us that they gathered together in an upper room awaiting the move that Jesus foretold. And it was some 10 days later after that, on the day of Pentecost, which under the Judean custom of gathering was the time for the Feast of Weeks, that the people began to gather in the place to celebrate Pentecost as it relates to 50 days after the first fruits harvest. And it is there during that time, and God is so intricate in how he does things, it is there in that time that a fresh, violent, mighty wind began to blow. And in Acts chapter 2, we see the birthing of the move of God's Holy Spirit upon the people of God. And it was there through sight and sound blowing of a mighty violent wind. The Bible says cloven tongues of fire began to separate, come into the room and separate and light self upon everyone that was in the room. And the Bible says that all were filled and as they were filled by way of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, they spoke in other tongues. Those tongues were not spiritual tongues, but those tongues were languages of those who had gathered from all around to celebrate the Feast of Weeks or the time of Pentecost. And it was there as they went out, people heard them speaking in their own native language. And it's there that the Bible says that the Spirit gave them the power and ability to do so. Somebody ought to celebrate the fact that God left us his Holy Spirit. And there we have the founding of the church started with the kindling of what I call fresh fire. Can we be honest this morning? Honest to ourselves and honest to the church universal. Where is the fire of God today? What happened to the fire that used to kindle and burn in the hearts and minds and lives of individual believers? Do we need time to kindle some form of fresh fire from God? What happened to our fire? Used to be a time that we had fire for God. We were on fire for God. We were on fire because God blessed us, changed us, turned our lives around for the better. We were excited to rush, whether to the screen or in person, to church. But now we filled our day with other activities that have no kind of connection to the fire of God. I knew I won't get many amens, but it's okay, amen. I got to still preach it. We, we put things in place of God. We put things ahead of God. We put people ahead of God. And therefore, beloved, our flame of fire has flickered out. So I want to start off this series. I want to start off this series on this day of Pentecost looking at how God calls Moses. I was led to Moses. The initial thing that I noticed as I'm reading the text in regards to Moses is that in Exodus chapter 3, before Moses became enamored by the flame, what I noticed was Moses was working and not necessarily worshiping. He was working, the Bible says, and not necessarily working. And listen, I want you to keep your Bibles open so you can see I'm not making anything up. Everything comes out of the word of God. Look at verse 1. 
Verse 1 says that Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, what you must know is that Moses had been doing this now for some 40 years plus. He had been doing the work of tending the sheep of his father-in-law, and he had been doing this successfully for 40 plus years. He had been taking them out and bringing them in. Moses was tending and really minding his own business. He was living an ordinary life in Midian. He was living a normal routine life for over 40 years. He was doing the work that he was supposed to do. Could it be, beloved, that we have over-spiritualized the fact that the way to get fire kindled in our lives is that it has to be while doing the act of worship when the reality is God is looking for consistency and God is looking for us to live our everyday normal lives in fear and in reverence of him. Don't you know that you can kindle fire while you're at work? You can kindle God's fire while you're on your lunch break. You can kindle God's fire while you're walking through the mall shopping. Amen. You can kindle God's fire while you're in the supermarket. You can kindle God's fire through normal everyday activities. But someone has told you that you had to be in church. Someone has told you that you had to be in a certain posture or position. But at last time I checked, God is um not present everywhere I am God is and so no matter where I am the fire of God can be kindled and when you go with me to the New Testament you'll see in Acts chapter 1 that the promise was given I told you he said you receive power from the Holy Spirit and watch it in Acts chapter 1 verse 12 the Bible says that they returned to Jerusalem from the hill and they gathered in the upper room. Verse 13 says they went upstairs. Verse 14 of Acts 1 says they prayed and while they were praying, they were awaiting what God was doing. But while they were waiting, they started working. Bible says Peter stood up among them and said, listen, we've had one that is no longer with us who has betrayed our Lord in Judas. And now we must select another in order to replace Judas that we might be about the business of carrying on the mission and mandate that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. The Bible says they cast lots. And as they were casting lots, it was between Justice and Matthias and Matthias. Matthias was the one that was chosen to do the work of ministry. They kept on doing the work. Here's the misconception, beloved. Moses was working. He wasn't even looking for God. But sometimes, beloved, while you're waiting, while you're praying, while you're working, while you're doing what you're supposed to do, God is looking at you. And is there a witness in the building that can testify that it seems like we don't know whether God is, is, is noticing us or not, but the reality is God sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. I ain't talking about Santa Claus either. He, he knows when you've been working or good, so you better start working for goodness sake. Amen. You got to do what God has called you to do. Moses was working on the backside of the mountain. He was there in the wilderness. He had been doing this for over 40 years. And God was watching him as he was going about his routine. And there must have been something about Moses. We know that he was put on the Nile in order to save his life. And he grew up a prince of Egypt only to be banished some 40 years later. We know that. But the reality is, beloved, he kept on doing a routine over and over again. And God watched out over him, over his routine. See, never dismiss the fact that God blessed you enough to be able to carry out the routine that you do every day of your life. 
Never dismiss the fact that God gave you the ability to have strength in your hand in order to put toothpaste on the toothbrush, in order to brush them 32, amen, or whatever you got, amen, uh, in your mouth, amen. Uh, God bless you with the fat and the ability to brew that coffee in the morning, put a little sugar and cream in it, and you're able to drink it in order to have energy to go about your day. It may seem normal or routine, but there are some people lying in hospital beds that wish they could do the routine, ordinary things that you're able to do right now. But thanks be to God that God looked out for me and watched over me in order to give me the activity of my limbs, the, the mindset to be able to think and the body to be able to move. Somebody ought to thank God for the routine things of life. We get so caught up because uh, that's just what I do every day. Don't take that for granted. Bible says Moses was working. He wasn't even looking for God, but God was looking at him. Now understand that while you're waiting, the Bible is expressing to us that you got to keep working because God desires to get close to not only the people who worship him, but God also desires to get close to, our, to people who are working. Notice in the midst of his work, in the midst of doing something ordinary, something extraordinary begins to take place. While working, Moses, who at this time had no expectations upon God or no expectations of God, saw the wonder and awesome nature of God on display in a burning bush. In fact, verse 2 tells us that the angel appeared in the fire and the bush burned, but it was not consumed. Verse 3 says, keep your Bibles open, that Moses sees this sight, marvels at the wonder of this sight, and then is drawn to come over to the fire, to the bush that was burning but did not burn up. Now here's what I've discovered. Over 40 years, tending sheep in the wilderness, it was a normal occurrence for shepherds to see burning bushes. I want to help you all today. It was a normal occurrence to see burning bushes. I looked it up. Y'all forgive me if I screw this up. Hey Amen. I'm not that good with these foreign names. But I, I, it, it's what is called a dictanimus albus plant. Dictanimus albus plant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. A dictanimus albus plant, which is also, you can look it up. It's also known as the burning bush plant that, that is indigenous to areas where there is extreme heat. And what I discovered is that these plants grow in desert places and the oil that secretes from the flowers and the berries that come from these bushes can light on fire due to the heat that surrounds and the sun that uh, comes down piercingly upon the plant. So it secretes oil. And when that oil is warmed up by the sun and the heat, it then would cause the bush to burst into flames that would flare up on the mountainside. So what Moses saw was not an unusual occurrence. But normally when the flare up of the bush took place by way of the dictanimus albus plant, amen, uh, 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 normally the flame would get hot, the bush would start burning, but then after a while, with no harm to the bush, the fire would die down. That's what normally would, took place, would take place. But what caused Moses to be captivated by the austere nature of this sight of this burning bush was that this bush kept burning and the heat and the fire and the flame did not flicker out. He said, I'm waiting on the fire to die down. I'm waiting on the fire to flicker out. But as he waited, the longer he waited, the more the fire 
God help me, started burning. The longer he gazed, the more he saw that the flame did not die down as normal. And so what captured Moses' attention was the flame does not die down. The bush was not consumed by the flame. Can I help somebody this morning? Maybe that's why our fire has flamed out because it's a scene, it's a scene that has become so familiar to us that we have familiarized our way with the way we do church that we're no longer in awe of the move of God in the place of God but we come to expect certain things to take place in the church and that expectation has now led to our limitation of not being moved by the fire of God. See, 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 some of us are stuck on what you expect to see when you come to church and when you come to worship. Some of us are stuck and no longer excited about the new possibilities that God is able to do in the house of worship because we're waiting on certain routine things to happen. We're waiting on the flame to light up for the church to get fish grease hot and then the next moment die down, not too long, Pastor, so that we can go home and get our brunch and play our games and go around the city and do what we want to do. I ain't getting no amens on that. We, we want things to flame up like fish grease, amen. Get hot, real hot, and then die down just long enough to let me out the back door so I can go on about my business and having checked the box to say I've been to church. But you know what, beloved? That's where we mess up. And the reason why I think Moses gathered to see this burning bush is because the flame never died down. In fact, the flame did not die down. Watch this, until Moses got a word from the Lord. And sometimes, beloved, while we're waiting on the heat to take place in the worship service, maybe God is waiting on us to have greater expectation from him and then we get the word that the Lord wants us to have so that we can live our lives according to what God has said. Amen, lights. Amen. Here it is. Sometimes, beloved, your spiritual flare-ups have flamed out. And maybe it's maybe because of the combination you're missing uh, of a few organ chords and steady drum beats and clapping of hands in order to really move you. And if that doesn't take place, then you're going to sit there like a knot on a log. Maybe your flare-ups have flamed out because, beloved, you're waiting on the melodic sound of strong vocals to be present in the service, to move upon the heartstrings of your life, to bring about a tender moment where you cry your tear in the church, and then that's where you're going to catch on fire. Maybe, just maybe, your flare-ups have flamed out because what Moses shows us in the text is is that sometimes you got to wait patiently, sometimes you got to sit and tarry, sometimes you got to look and stare and wait on a word from God that will move you in order to know that God's spirit is alive and well in your life. Did anybody come early on a Sunday morning, whether a virtual or in person, to say, Lord, I'm waiting on an expectation and waiting on a great move of God in order for me to get what I need. Hallelujah. Y'all sit down, you're making me nervous. But it is Pentecost Sunday. You can go on and praise him if you want to. Because how many know God is good? God is wonderful. Listen, if anything else, he woke us up this morning, started us on our way, gave us another opportunity to get it right from where we messed up last night. And God says, I've given you another chance. That's something to praise God for. Anybody grateful? Come on, clap those hands, Zion. Here it is. I got to do a little more teaching here. I'm almost done with this first installment. Listen, Moses teaches us as we move to engage God that we must allow God to engage us. We cannot put God on a clock. We cannot regulate or legislate God. 
We cannot put God in a perch or in a box that we can check off having said done and expect the fresh fire of God to live in our lives. Your flame will flicker out. The work of ministry is too challenging. Living holy is too challenging. Living as a believer and a Christian is overbearing sometimes. Sometimes, beloved, you need to put yourself in position because you're going to have days where you don't feel like it. You're going to have days where you don't feel like coming to church. You're going to have days where you don't feel like tuning in. But thanks be to God that something on the inside started moving on the outside. And the moment the Lord opened up our eyes to a brand new day. You said in your mind, the first thing you said was, thank you, Lord. And then the next thing you said is, I'm getting ready to go to church to give God worship and praise because he is the priority. Watch this. Notice that the fire stops him. The fire makes him stare at the flame, and that's when God speaks. Watch the text. He stops. He stares. Then God speaks. We're waiting on God. Come on, God, speak. And God said, I've been speaking all along. Have you stopped long enough to notice my word? And have you stared or stayed long enough in a position to receive my word? Sometimes, beloved, we got to stop. Sometimes we got to stay or stare and then God will speak. Verse 4 says this. Watch the text. I'm in the book. Verse 4 says that when God saw Moses coming because Moses was attracted to the fire. The Bible says God called out to him from the bush. And notice what he says. Don't miss this. He says, Moses, 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 Moses. This is what I learned when I studied Hebrew in seminary, uh, that any time there is uh, emphasis put on a word, it is due to the fact that the Hebrew writer wants us to be sure to look at what is being said and what is being... Notice he didn't just say Moses. He said Moses... Moses. See, see, we, we here's, can, can I help somebody? Don't y'all write letters and don't y'all get mad. Please, it's Pentecost Sunday. Be kind. Uh, but we need to stop looking for the sensational and start seeking the relational connection with God. That's what's happening here. He stopped. He stayed and stared. And that's when God spoke to Moses and when, Mo when God spoke he said Moses Moses and notice the response that Moses gave here am I Lord here am I Lord and see this notice this is when uh, whenever you want emphasis on something in Hebrew uh, you double it or you repeat it but the doubling of a name in Hebrew means that there then is the expression of a desire for intimacy between the divine and holy and the individual being called. I know I'm right about it. That, that there then is the expressed desire for intimacy, a relational bond between individuals. Okay, y'all y'all got quiet on me. Let me see if I can help you here. In Genesis chapter 22, it's the story of when Abraham was getting ready to kill Isaac atop Mount Moriah as a test to see if he really loved God more than the son of promise. And it was there as Abraham was getting ready to raise the knife to, to commit a, a, a murder against his own son that the angel held back his hand. But notice that the angel just didn't hold back his hand. The angel said, Abraham, Abraham. Now I know that you love me more than anything else. Okay, let me take a New Testament for you. 
It was in Acts chapter 9 that a man named Saul was on a Damascus road headed to arrest people who were following Jesus. And as he was on the road, the Bible says a blinding light knocked him off his high horse. Lord, I could stay there all day. I got to move. Knocked him off his high horse. And it was there that the voice of God, watch it, said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That's what the text says. And, and this helps us to understand that in each instance, God was crafting and designing a way in order to have a relational connection with these individuals. Now, they weren't looking for the sensational. The sensational happened in the midst of building a relational connection. I think we got it back with y'all. We're looking for something sensational to draw us into a relationship with God. When God says, I'm ready to give you my word, I'm ready to call you to do more, but I need to know if you're serious about this relationship thing, that you're serious about what you want to do with me. Watch this, watch this. He says, Exodus 3, Moses, Moses. In other words, Moses, I know you. And not only do I know you, but I want to get close to you. I want to get close to you, Moses. God, through his fresh fire in the burning bush, is wanting to establish a relationship, but not just any relationship. He wants to establish a relationship, but this relationship was under the guise of God's redemption for us. Watch this. The fire of God is about the call from the fall. Tell your neighbor, call from the fall. Y'all do it at home too. Call from the fall. Put it in the chat. Amen. Call from the fall. See, here it is. God wants to restore what was lost in the fall of Adam and Eve. And so every chance throughout the annals of biblical history since the time of the fall, God has been devising ways in order to establish or reestablish a relational connection between the creation and the creator. Now get this, Adam and Eve exit from Eden. Now it was not so much beloved, uh, uh, the removal from the place that was so devastating. But it was because of sin that sin caused them to be not only removed from the place called Eden, but also removed from the presence of Almighty God. And it's one thing to be removed from a place but it's something else totally to be removed from the very presence of Almighty God. Now here's, here, here we see God mm -hmm, using fresh fire, appearing to Moses as a means to get close and reestablish a relationship not only with Moses, but to the nation that shall follow Moses out of Egypt. And so it's a part of the purpose of redemption for the people of God. But the fire, watch this, in the burning bush, please be clear, it's not only about relationship, but the fire in the burning bush is also about reverence and revering God. I know I'm right about it because notice this, verse 4, God calls out to Moses, Moses answers, here I am. He wants to establish a closer relationship with Moses. But then verse 5, look at verse 5. Keep your Bibles open. Verse 5 says, God then says as he comes closer, do not come any closer to me. Take off your sandals for the ground or the place where you are standing is holy ground. This messed me up. On one instance, God, you got the fire going. I get closer. I'm coming. You call my name. And as the name is called, you want to establish a relationship. But the moment I try to come even a little bit closer, God said, ah, ah, that's enough. Stop right there. Do not come any closer. Is it 
Which is it, God? Do you want me to come close or do you want me to stay back? Do you want me to come into your presence or do you want me to stay away? Part of the reason why the fire of God is not fresh in some of our lives is because we want the relationship without revering who God is. We want the relationship without reverencing the presence of Almighty God in our lives. And see, God used fire and smoke in the Old Testament to symbolize his presence. I'm gonna give you, I'm just doing Bible today. In Genesis 15, 17, write it down. Genesis 15, 17 is the first time we see as God is making his covenant with Abraham that God begins to show him a vision of a day that is split between light and darkness. And in that, that, that mental image, God shows Abraham in the midst, a Bible says here, uh, where while he was establishing a covenant with Abraham, Abraham gets a glimpse of a smoking fire pot and flaming torch that passed through the bloody sacrificial aisle labeled to the children of Israel. And what this was, was a warning to Abraham about the impending sin of three generations of descendants that will come through him. And the Bible says it's not until the fourth generation that I'll be able to bring them back to this hollowed spot of ground. But y'all gonna have to go through a lot. God showed him a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch in that vision. And it's from there that we see, beloved, in time of the Exodus, the pillar of smoke during the day and the pillar of fire at night that would lead them to the place of promise. And when they reach Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, whatever name you want to call it, the Bible says that there was fire, there was smoke, there was lightning and thunder that came down from heaven to the mountain, giving them the sight and sound of God's holiness, the sight and sound of God's righteousness, the sight and sound of God's goodness and his graciousness that he is an almighty God. Here's the last thing I'll give you and I'll stop here. Let me be clear that God deserves and desires, God desires a relationship with us. But beloved, God is not to be trifled with. Please hear me. He wants to establish, to reestablish, to rekindle fresh fire, a relationship with us. But God is not to be trifled with. He's not your plaything. He's not just someone that you can do all willy-nilly. In fact, old folks used to say, don't play with God because God runs the game by his rules. So you ain't got time to play with God because as you're thinking, you got the upper hand. God will show you who has the upper hand. So yes, Moses is attending to the fire. He is attracted to the fire. But when he gets close to the fire, he is confronted by the God of the fire. Say, you can't come any closer. Here's the thing, beloved. We are all confronted with the need for relationship with God, but also the desire and need to reverence who God is. If you really want to rekindle the fire in your life, you got to start by making sure you've got a connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop seeking the sensational. And notice that when you start getting in relationship with God, that God will start engaging you. But don't forget, hallelujah, that God is holy. We may be attracted to his presence, but we must revere the power behind his presence. We must revere the power and awesome nature behind who God is. And when I take it back to Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that they were in the upper room on one accord, awaiting the move from Almighty God. So when we're all in the same place, 
all on the same mind, focused on nothing but God. That's when God can reign in. And they didn't know when God was going to show up. But 10 days later, the Spirit of God began to blow in like a mighty rushing wind. And that mighty rushing wind sat on them like cloven tongues of fire. And they were able to do the work of ministry. They were able to speak language of those who had, they had not encountered before because the fire of God is an all-consuming fire. The fire of God is a fire that is not to be played with. It's not to be trifled with. It's not to be just willy-nilly with. Amen. I'll leave you with this illustration. It's a true story. Uh, I can remember when I was a young teenager, I was in the kitchen and my mama, who's sitting right there, told me to get your hind parts in that kitchen and, and clean up the kitchen. She had two boys. We still had to do it, y'all. Amen. Now, I was huffing and puffing as I was going in the kitchen, and mama expected not only the dishes and the knives and forks to be washed, but she said everything in the kitchen better be clean. <laughs> hey, the young folk don't understand that today. They think they do a dish, and they think they do a little uh, thing like this, and they done. Amen. No. Uh, you got to sweep the floor. Lord, have mercy. You got to wipe down the microwave. Clean the inside of the microwave, amen. You, you got to uh, wipe down the refrigerator, amen. And, and, and my mother had just finished cooking not too long ago, but I wasn't paying attention to the fact that, that, that I just was upset because I had to go in the kitchen and wash the dishes. And, and one of the things we had to do was clean the stove. Y'all don't know nothing about that. <laughs> clean the stove from the little crumbs that got under the metal grates that was right there, amen. And so out of my anger, and my, my angst of cleaning the kitchen, I picked up the metal grate with my hand and it was still hot from the time mama was cooking. I dropped the metal grate. I got upset with myself because I should have realized that there was fire that just was right there. But because I didn't reference the fact that the metal grate was still hot, I got burned on my hands. Now watch this. It didn't stop me, God help me, from going into the kitchen because that's where the food is. It didn't stop me me from going in the kitchen because that's where the meals are prepared but what it did every time I go into a kitchen to this day is I make sure that I look at the stove and I make sure before any cleaning goes on that the stove has cooled down what am I saying sometimes beloved God puts us in a situation where we need to understand that he not only wants a relationship not not only wants us to reverence him, but you're going to respect who God is in your life. And is there anybody in here? You've been in a position and you've been in a place where you've had to respect who God is in your life. And if you ain't humble, how many know that he'll humble you? If you exalt yourself before God, he'll bring you down. But thanks be to God that he loved us enough to give us another opportunity to say thank you Lord, thank you God. And the fire was rekindled. Get a relationship with him. God wants to speak a word, but you gotta stop. You gotta stay. And then God will speak. And God will give you a word that will connect you in relationship to him. And that word will come forward to say, I want to be with you. But listen, I ain't to be played with. Don't come no closer. In fact, pull off your sandals. Because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. He's like a consuming fire, sweet perfume. His awesome presence fills this room. Because this is, hallelujah holy ground anybody thankful for holy ground listen holy ground is wherever the lord is it could be in church it can be in a chapel it can be at school it could be at your desk at your in your office or your cubicle it can be wherever you are 
because the Lord is there. He's there to meet us. He's there to be with us. The Lord is holy and he should be reverenced.